Mistress Vanya Changes Jobs, Episode 1 I blame the internet, said Mistress Vanya. Then again you could say that about most things wrong with the world today. She was sitting in her salon, with Raymond, her long-time acquaintance and client. Raymond was a man in his seventies, with thick grey hair and tailored suit. For his age he had young teeth and young eyes, yet the saggy folds of his skin on his face showed every day of his seventy-three years. His slight punch was hidden by the cut of his clothes, proof that paying more for the best tailors was money well spent. Mistress Vania was in her mid-forties, tall and regal in appearance. She had copious quantities of black hair, tied in an elaborate style of braids and plaits. Sitting in her leather chair, she looked aristocratic, like a Victorian oil-painting portrait of some wealthy merchant's wife. Mistress Vania was never casual, instead choosing to spend every moment drawing from a repertoire of deliberate poses. It's not like it used to be, said Raymond, sighing quietly. We've been carried along on a tide of technological change. Even our sessions have changed beyond recognition. Nothing is spared. As though on cue, a petite Japanese woman in her early twenties entered the room. She wore her hair in a bun and sixteen different shades of bubblegum pink right down to her slippers with the sleeping cartoon faces on the toes. Like a waitress in a restaurant, she carried a drinks tray on an upturned hand. She gave Mistress Vania a black espresso coffee, while Raymond received a minimalistic glass of water. Thank you, Rico, said Mistress Vania. That will be all. Rico retired to her footstool in the corner of the salon and sat with her knees under her chin. You know you could have something other than water, said Mistress Vania sternly. I know, said Raymond. But it reminds me of the days when you would deny me any kind of pleasure, where you would take complete control. Call it a last gesture of submission? Never mind last gestures, sniffed Mr. Svania. You may be the last of the submissives. The internet has addled the minds of my clients. Fools and lunatics make for poor material with which to work. A moment of silence followed, as each were lost in their own thoughts. Finally, Mr. Svania craned her neck to see where Rico had gone. She was still sitting on the footstool. Rico, she said sternly, get Raymond an espresso. He's annoying me with this ridiculous affectation of self-denial. And put sugar in it. Rico swiftly left the room. Raymond found it unnerving how she could move so quickly without running. Please, mistress, said Raymond, don't be kind to me. The whole idea throws me off my centre. Nonsense, said Mr. Svania. You are a desperately foolish old man, but you have always had your own standards. You have always appreciated my attention to detail. That at least is something going in your favour. Always, agreed Raymond. I treasure the moments we have had together. When we first met, it thrilled me that you even noticed me. Indeed, said Mr. Svania. I noticed you to the extent that it amused me to dominate you to inflict carefully meted out doses of pain and cruelty. You wouldn't have done that for just anyone, said Raymond. It made me feel special. Mr. Svania looked sceptical and slightly bored by what Raymond was saying. Rico returned with Raymond's espresso. He drank it as though it was something luxurious. Mr. Svania wondered if he was drinking it out of pleasure, or simply because she had told him to drink it. Her domination of Raymond had been so complete it was almost ruinous. She concluded that he was drinking it out of blind obedience. This was the nub of her problem. All her submissives had given in completely. She required some inner struggle for it to be worth while. She wanted a part of them to still revile their own weakness. Her powers had heightened, as conversely her new clients had become weaker and more stupid, even from the outset. She likened it to the breeding of show dogs. Successive generations had been selected for beauty and nothing else. The results were exquisitely proportioned morons. She felt all her newer clients were the manifestation of some kind of slow-moving societal collapse. This worried her, but only for selfish reasons. You're not special, said Mr. Svania, but you are, Raymond, enduring. I will give you credit for that. I admit, 
It makes you sound like an institution or a Chesterfield sofa, but I call it the way I see it. I think one day, said Raymond, his knees together and his hands in his lap, you may, perhaps, think of me as your friend. He completed the sentence with a nervous laugh. It would have been small mercy if Mrs. Varnia had laughed mockingly back at him, even if she had berated him. Even that would have been better, yet instead she just stared at him blankly, as though his words were completely incomprehensible. I don't have friends, said Mr. Svania, stroking her skirt with the palms of her hands until it was completely flat. I neither want nor do I need friends. Not even one, queried Raymond, sounding almost frightened. Finally hearing her say what he instinctively already knew, made it even more shocking. "'I can think of no one I want to be friends with,' said Mistress Vania. There was a finality to this reasoning. "'You are an island,' said Raymond admiringly. Mistress Vania maintained her inscrutability, but seemed satisfied with this assessment. "'And you, Raymond, will always be the mainland. Do you not care that for the last three sessions we've done nothing? For an hour I drink coffee and glance bored?' in your direction occasionally. And charge me the usual rate, conceded Raymond. With nothing in return, it was quite cruel. I did feel cheated and disappointed. It was quite intimidating at first, although this time, the third time, it has become a little dull. We have become like old married couples, said Mr. Zvania, and this made Raymond give a furtive smile. They sit in silence for hours. They don't talk, because there's nothing to be said. They've already said everything there is to say. That's so kind of you, said Raymond, to make such a complimentary analogy. It wasn't intended that way, said Mistress Varnia plainly. You are the last of my clients who was anything close to approaching human. I blame the Internet. I can tell by your expression. You have not got the slightest idea of my troubles. Do you even use the Internet? I send emails, said Raymond proudly. And there is the financial news and the stock prices I find online. I know my way around the Internet. Yes, pressed Mr. Sonia, her bottom teeth always showing more when she was irritated. But do you watch the streaming video, the vast array of S&M bondage websites, the thousands more sites dedicated to the marginal and increasingly obscure subcategories? Raymond shook his head. And it shows, continued Mr. Svania. I would know if you were lying, not just because I can read you like a book. I can tell because your brain, as weak as it is, has not yet been addled by the Internet. My younger clients, and they're all younger than you, thirties and forties, are obsessed with finding something new, novelty. When I dominate someone, it is my choice what is to be done. I decide the acts to be performed. It's not random. It's not made up as I go along. I compose each session like a symphony. This new breed of client does not understand that. They come to me with their smartphone streaming video of amateur dominatrix, all aesthetics and no composition, social science degree dropouts in latex. They have a grab bag of videos collected together. They have the audacity to say, Please, I would like this today. Do you think it's a la carte? a bingo hall cafeteria, I offer them the bondage equivalent of lobster bisque, and they ask for a veggie burger. Raymond shuddered at the thought of a burger patty made from soybeans and single-cell fungal protein. The whole point of domination is control, said Raymond sympathetically. It's nice just to submit and give in. If they control what's done, then it's pointless. They might as well whip themselves. Precisely, said Mr. Svania, and at one point I did just that. Such was my frustration. Thanks to the Internet, they've seen it all. When you came to me years ago, you had some spirit, confidence, and self-worth. I felt the resistance. There was something there for me to crush, to tease and taunt, to take you to the brink and then deny you any kind of satisfaction. Over time I broke you. You did break me, agreed Raymond echoing the sentiment as he relived 
in his mind a kaleidoscope of experiences from hundreds of sessions. But these new clients, stressed Mr. Svania, for them it starts on the internet and not in my rooms. It should always originate with me. They treat me like a theme park. I've seen the movie, now experience the ride. Their minds are adult. They come to me as empty vessels, morons, grass-eating animals. It's not physical pain alone. It's something extraordinary created in the mind. Yet nothing leaves an impression on them. For each session they're dead to me. They are corpses with fat bank balances. You're right to blame the internet, said Raymond. It has created a new generation. I used to remember when being bisexual was noteworthy. Now it's a profile category in social media, said Mr. Desania, sipping her coffee. Rico and I have discussed this sad state of affairs, yet we're too close to it. I did not think it would come to this, Raymond, but I would like your opinion. Raymond swooned like he was going to faint. The rush of excitement that these words created in him caused his face to go red. Honestly, Mr. Svania, managed Raymond, his hands shaking as he put down the cup, this is so unexpected. Don't make a meal of it, said Mr. Svania, now doubting the merit of the idea. Just say what you think. Sex is dead, shouted Raymond. This outburst caused Rico to jump with a start. It was only the briefest of lapses. Annoyed, she regained her composure in an instant. Go on, prompted Mr. Svania, the idea piquing her interest. The, 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 these things that you, you do for your clients, started Raymond. People think it's about sex, but it's not. Mr. Svania looked doubtful, but Raymond pushed on. He was rambling now and couldn't stop. It's about so much more. There's a long tradition going back centuries, yet, to a certain extent, they all have the common thread of bondage and discipline. You forgot humiliation, said Mr. Svania. Yes, said Raymond, excited. This is what I'm getting at. Sex is never at the forefront. It's always a subtext. That's why your clients are dead to you. They've gorged themselves on the internet, taking on every fetish and fantasy, played out by thousands of people, hour after hour of whipping and clamping and degradation. By the time they come to you, they're hopelessly overstimulated. It's simple economics. The surest way to reduce the value of something is to create an oversupply. For some, sex has reached saturation point. Saturation, said Mistress Varnia almost tasting the word as she said it. They have become the truest voyeurs. They'd rather watch it vicariously than participate themselves. You're right, Raymond. I often feel that I could dominate someone else while they watched. It would make no difference to them. Their experience is always passive. So we're back to where we started. We blame the internet. Sex is dead, whispered Rico's voice from the corner of the room. What's replaced it? asked Mistress Vania, addressing no one in particular. Food, began Raymond, his voice timid. For the first time, Mistress Vania looked startled. Instinctively, she stood up, only to find herself confused and wanting to sit down again. Oh, dear, she whispered. I hadn't thought of that. It's been there all the time, but I never saw it. The Epicure magazines, the beautifully photographed colour supplements in the quality newspapers, the rise of the celebrity chef, the mindless food programmes masquerading as travel shows. Food is the new sex, the new pornography. When a midget hermaphrodite lesbian call girl with a flair for alien body modification is less interesting than gluten-free bacon desserts, you know you have a problem. Yet being fat is an outrage, added Raymond. Yes, agreed Miss Rosvania. It's like being gay in the 1950s. People are disgusted by you. They want to cure you or lock you up. To save you from yourself and your debauched inclinations, your unnatural impulse to eat, your unhealthy love of fat, be it baked, fried or drizzled, the subtext can no longer be sex. It must be food. Obese people's lust is insatiable, said Raymond. And the gym is filled with personal trainers. They are the priests of our time, seeking conversion among the overweight heathens. I can dominate fat people, said Mr. Svania, pressing her hands down the sides of her ribs, past her waist and down over her hips. What an exciting prospect! 
to find a person so fat they would eat themselves into an early grave. I will use my strength of personality to dominate them, render them to a thin shadow of their former selves, and they'll never be willing participants, which is just the kind of resistance I'm wanting. They'll have to be captured, imprisoned. So you're pleased with me? asked Raymond. I've had a fine idea. I've gained a few pounds lately. You could start with me. I'm more than happy to be your guinea pig. Mistress Vanya looked at Raymond like he were a worthless stick of furniture. I must think, she said. I'll be in my study. But what about me? cried Raymond. I still have half an hour left. Mistress Vanya turned to Rico and said, Give him a coffee, Anima, and get rid of him. The thought of a forcibly administered aromatic purgative made Raymond shake with excitement. Raymond adored her, not because she was good to him, but because she was cruel.